I'm obviously not uh, Pastor Chris Fagans. I am a dear friend of his, and uh, I count it a pure blessing uh, to be with you on today. My name is Jeremy Williams. Uh, I hail from just probably about two miles up the street from Concord Church, uh, where I'm associate pastor of Grow Groups there. Uh, and this is, I see a lot of new faces. I see some familiar faces as well. This is my second time with you guys. So either I messed up so bad he gave me another chance to get it right, or it was at least one thing that I said that stuck with him and the congregation. So thank you so much. I bring you greetings, uh, of course, from my senior pastor, Pastor Brian Carter. want to uh, give thanks, uh, of course, to God for the opportunity. My parents are in the house as well. Uh, so thank you for them. Um, they're my road buddies. They're, they're, they're my preaching road buddies. They, they, uh, they live in Louisville, Texas, and travel all the way to sunny South Dallas to support, to support their only child and son. So they don't have a choice, right? I don't split attention with anybody. Um, uh, my wife and, uh, uh, and children are on their way as well. I uh, have a nine-month-old daughter, uh, eight, eight-year-old daughter, and an eight-year-old son. So she has her hands full. Uh, I believe we're going to be missing one, but nonetheless, the one that is most rambunctious, that being the nine-month-old, is in tow. Uh, so they will be here shortly. If you would, go with me in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for an opportunity just to proclaim your word. Lord, and I just come praying now that everything that I say and do might be pleasing before your sight. I'm not here for mere man or woman, Lord. I'm here to present a gospel, dear Lord, that is clear in what it aims to do. And Lord, that aim is to bring us closer to you. Lord, I just come praying now, even as a fallen man, dear Lord, even amongst a fallen people, dear Lord, just that you use today, dear Lord, just to encourage our hearts, just to remind us whose we are, what you've sent us here to do but most importantly, who you sent us here to be. Lord, in today's society, we need you like none other. There's so many things going on in the news, even within our own homes. I just come praying now that, again, you use this time to uplift us, encourage us, and even in some ways make us upset about things that we're doing against your word. To cause a change, dear Lord, not just today, but in the days and years to come. Lord, we thank you. And for whatever this day is, we give you all the honor and glory that your name well deserves. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You may have your seats. Actually, I'm sorry. I told you to sit down. Would you stand for the reading of the word? I'm not nervous at all, I promise. If you would, turn with me to the book of Matthew. Thank you for the AV. I really appreciate it. Hook me up. That's the same as I really appreciate it, sir. Uh, again, Matthew chapter 14. I'll be beginning at verse 22. Again, beginning at verse 22, and it reads... Reading from the English Standard Version. Immediately he made, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from land. Beaten by the waves from the wind was against them. And in the fourth night of the in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out onto the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat. And I say, so Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased and those in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. You may have your seats. Just read for you again. 
Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Just to give you a bit of background at, before we get started on today, the, in this segment of the Bible, John the Baptist had just been beheaded by King Herod. And Jesus, hearing of this, withdrew privately to mourn, to a place of seclusion, but only to be followed by a huge crowd, much like he garnered on his walk on earth. He had compassion on the crowd, although his disciples said, Jesus, we hungry. And he said, well, I got, I got 5,000 people to feed. Uh, and that's not counting men. I, I'm sorry, that's not counting women and children. So Jesus, having compassion on them, fed them with two loaves of bread. And the amazing thing about that is that, that although Jesus was trying to have a moment to, his, to himself, he still took time out for the multitude who needed him more than what he needed to be alone at that point in time. So after he had fed the crowd, he dismissed the disciples and told them to go onto the boat and go out onto the water and he would meet them on the other side. If I can add a tag to this text for today, I want to call it when a disciple is distracted by fear. When a disciple is distracted by fear. I want to make one thing very certain and clear here is that a disciple is also you and I. If you claim to be a Christian, a follower of Christ, you too are a disciple. So I want to make clear that I'm not talking about just ancient time, disciples, people following Christ back then, but I'm talking about even us today. I'll speak from a historical standpoint and intermingle what it means for us today. But if you would lean in for a moment around the topic of when a disciple is distracted by fear. In the Bible, fear is mentioned some 70 times, namely as to how Christians should fear the Lord. Fearing the Lord is a lot different than just ordinary fear. Fearing God, there's a reverence that we need to have for Jesus Christ. There is, we can't just walk up to Jesus and say, hey man, what's up man, I, how you doing? No, 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 no. Much like when my kids walk up to me, they can't call me by my first name and say, hey, man, you go give me something to eat. <laughs> there needs to be a fear and trembling when my kids approach me just because of who I am to them. And so that same fear is the fear and reverence we should have with Jesus Christ. However, there is also a set of unhealthy fear. Many of, many of us have fears, much like myself, of heights. Some of you have fear of water. Some of you have a fear of falling. Some of you have a fear of bugs. Some of you have a fear of just life itself. And as we approach the text today, I also just want to be reminded that in the book of Genesis is where fear first hit the scene. Jesus, God at that time after creating Adam and giving him Eve, told them, hey, you can go out throughout the whole being that I made. But one thing you cannot do is eat of the tree. Eve eventually convinced Adam that, hey, if we eat of this tree, we'll be like one of the gods. Yeah. So after eating of the tree, immediately they went and hid. Before that, they walked around completely naked. They had no shame. And God, when he came looking for Adam and Eve, although Eve was the person who was deceived by the serpent, by the devil, when God came looking, guess who he came looking for? Guess who is the first name that he called? He called Adam's name. Adam, where are you? Adam crouching down behind the tree because then his eyes were open. He knew he was naked. And shame and fear entered the world. And we've been consequences of that time ever since. As we approach this text, again, I want you to keep in mind that that was the original onset of fear. Unhealthy fear. It wasn't a reverence. They were not hiding because, oh, no, God is coming, so I can't look at his glory. No, they were hiding because they knew they had sinned. Yeah, yeah. Fear can be described as a base of these references as a distraction that is needed to uproot, misguide, misalign, and confuse the purposes of God for our lives. Today, as I try to unpack for our time together in street, the intriguing story of Peter, the disciple who was distracted by fear, let us remember that we, too, are oftentimes distracted by fear. 
For our time today, I'd like to discuss three simple elements. This is a Baptist setting, so of course there's three points. Uh, and some preachers saying a pepper, but I'm not a hooper, so you're not going to get that today. I'm sorry. If you do, trust me, he has, he, he has moved mightily in this place. I won't quench the spirit, but I know my gifts. A disciple is distracted by fear when they can't clearly see the Savior. First point, a disciple is distracted by fear when they can't clearly see the Savior. As we approach verse 26, we see that the disciples are in a state of complete and utter shock, just simply because in their own words, they have just seen a ghost. As a reader, we have the advantage of knowing that is Jesus. However, if you're in the company of the disciples, you have to understand this was in the third watch of the night. The winds and the waters are going nuts. Third watch of the night would have been three, four, five o'clock in the morning. Some of us are just getting home or still out at that point in time. But for me and myself, if something happens at three, four, five o'clock in the morning, it's a problem. And I think I would be very fearful. So the disciples say it's a ghost. Keep in mind, they didn't have the advantage of knowing or having binoculars or having night vision. They were simply on a boat where the sea and the wind and everything was going crazy. So they say it's a ghost. Jesus approaches them in the middle of the night. It's not a customary time as to when they thought Jesus would approach them. But then again, did he tell them what time they were coming? Did, did, did he mention to them, hey, I'll be there at about no, he, he said, get in the boat and go to the other side. Everything that I'm saying, I want you to hang on to and make sure you make a note of it. Jesus told them to get in the boat and go to the other side. No other instructions were given. Amen. Get in the boat, go to the other side. What time do you guys get out of church? 12? All right, y'all will be here till 2. I preach long, but uh, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Y'all say amen, I promise to be done in two hours, but... Uh, He told them to get into the boat, go to the other side. That's it. That's it. Get in the boat, go to the other side. Disciples got in the boat. They were on their way to the other side. Jesus rose up on them at 3, 4, 5 o'clock in the morning. And they're wondering, what in the world is this? And in their own words, it's a ghost. When have you been on an assignment that you even knew was from the Lord, but then in the midst of it, in the very middle and midst of doing what it is God told you to do, something happened. God, you told me to take this job, and I didn't, I didn't, I didn't set up here and roll up in this thing. I can't stand nobody. <laughs> this trifling boss, you done got me. Come on. I like. That, that's, that's not what I signed up for. Now, this relationship, Jesus, God, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do the right thing. I said I do, but I didn't say I do to all. This, this is, whew. Now, these kids you done sent me, these, 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 these beautiful kids that you sent me, Lord, now, I done told them to do something once, twice, three times when I was younger. My lips would have been across the street. But right now, these kids that you've sent me are not doing what it is I've asked them to do. In the middle of what your assignment is, you too have your ghost experiences. We too have our ghost experiences. What, what in the world is this? It's a ghost. I don't know what it is. God, what, what is it that you're doing in my life? You told me to go to the job two weeks later. This don't make sense. God, you told me that you was going to provide all of my needs. All, every, every one of my needs. Needs on the left, wants to the right. All of my needs. I want a new car, though. Like, you know, this, this, one, this one here gets me from point A to point B, but you see my neighbors like that. Yeah. 
We can easily focus on the disciples and their inability to be distracted in the situation or their ability to be distracted in the situation. But we, too, as I mentioned, have our own life experiences to where fear grabs us. Not to mention our health, right? You go to the doctor, right? My daughter, I was very, very little as a kid. Very, You wouldn't know it now, but I was very, very small as a child. My wife isn't large at all. So she went to the doctor, and the doctor, the last time we took her, three months ago, she was 15 pounds. Next time we took her, she was 18. So doc, she's not gaining weight like she's supposed to. Head is growing like it's supposed to. She's a length that she is. She's just not gaining weight like she's supposed to. Right there in that very moment, we were just getting off of a flight, coming back from vacation, getting this news. And I remember thinking to myself, God, on the cusp of just coming from having a great time connecting with my bride, here we are now on the surface of, I don't know, they're testing her for anemia. Lord, please, please, please. If I'm being honest, fear set in really, really, really quickly. And I had to redirect myself. The Bible says the Lord didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of sound mind and self-control. So if fear is not of the Lord, who is it from? If fear isn't from God, who, 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 who is the originator of fear? If God says, I did not give you, I did not loan to you. I did not give you for temporary purposes fear. Then where does it come from? Distractions are all around us. And if the devil can get us off track just, just, just a little bit. He doesn't even need to get us. Most of us think when the devil comes, he plans to just completely obliterate things. And it's really, really obvious. Sometimes if the Lord tells you, stand right here, when you do this, if the Lord didn't tell you to step right, that's not his instruction. And then we wonder sometimes, well, why am I catching so much hell over here? I didn't tell you to stand there in the first place. I told you to go to the job. I told you to be faithful for a year. You're there two months, and you're applying for the highest position at the company. (laughs) And wondering why. God, why won't you show up? I just told you to go to work. I didn't grow up with aspirations to be a preacher and all this stuff. I I had a plan to be a businessman, to be a real estate broker and make a bunch of money and do a bunch of stuff. And I remember when God told me, hey, 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 Jay, I need you to I need you to take this ministry thing. I don't know what ministry is. I don't even know all the books of the Bible, man. I, are you? Me? Me? This guy I went to college with saw me one time. He said, man, if God can do it through you, he can do it through anybody. So for a season, guess what I had to do? Just stand steady in what the Lord told me to do. I couldn't question because guess what? I didn't even know what to ask. I didn't know what to expect. The disciples, he told them to get in the boat and go to the other side. Sometimes my kids ask these questions here. Maybe your kids do the same. Hey, um, we'll tell them, hey, we're going to Dave and Buster's. Okay, cool. Then what are we doing after that? And then what are we going to do when we get there? And then, and then when we get home, what about tomorrow? What, what are we doing tomorrow? I remember when I was a kid, you couldn't ask all them questions. It, it, just go do what I told you to do. Right? And sometimes that's how we approach God. God, I want all the steps. I want, I want if, if, if it's 10 steps, I want you to give me 12. I want you to give me two bonus steps too, right? God, because I just want to make sure it's you. If he gives us all the steps, two things. If if he gives us all the steps, will we not mess it up? 
If if God told you everything he was about to do in your life, you don't think you and me could really, really mess that thing up. You go to work, well, I know what the Lord is telling me to do. I'm going to be CEO. What about you? (laughs) And the other thing, if he told us every step, where does faith come in? Where, 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 Where does faith reside when you have all the answers? When you know everything. When you got everything planned out. Where is faith? The first one, a disciple is distracted by fear when the Savior is not clearly seen. There are points and places in your life that you have to know God is at work. And lean in real quickly. It's going to be times where it's uncomfortable. God doesn't work in places where it's, oh, man, I just... There are seasons, okay? There are seasons where God is working and doing some things in your life. You say, man, this is, ain't he all right? (laughs) And there's other seasons like, ain't he, ain't he, ain't, (laughs) Jesus, ain't he? Where are you? It's in the seasons where you're wondering where he's at when it's those two, three words, or whatever the instruction is that you need to be the most faithful. I was talking to a young man this past week, and he was asking me, hey, should I take a promotion? Should I do this? Should should I do this? I said, hey, man, stop. I said, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? It was a setup. What do you want to do? Man, you know, my my aspirations is to, you know, be account executive and stay here in Dallas and, and and do this because if I go back home, you know, it's a lot of stuff back home that I don't really want to be involved in. So, you know, those are my, those are my aspirations. He, he, he added some other stuff to it. I said, okay. I said, what does God want you to do? What do you mean? I said, well, what God wants you to do, does it match what you want to do? How am I supposed to know that? Typically, what God wants you to do, typically, what God wants you to do is going to be uncomfortable. God doesn't, God typically doesn't choose to work in situations where it's warm and fuzzy. But we're a comfort crowd, typically. If it's no order, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't. And then we resort back to what we know, and then we wonder why when we're in what we know, why is this so uncomfortable? Because you're still not where you're supposed to be. Point number two, a disciple is distracted by fear when God's identity is questioned. Verse 27 shows God not only identifying himself, but also immediately answering the the disciples' cry for help. In the B portion of verse 26, it says they cried out in fear. Verse 27 says, and hang on to this, verse 27 says, but Immediately, Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Verse 28 and 29 are Jesus and Peter having a volley match of sort of words. And just put a pin here for a moment. Peter was the type of disciple that oftentimes, if I'm being honest, I probably have some Peter in me. Peter was a, Peter was a, um, I won't tell too much about myself. I should. So, Peter was the type of disciple that, yes, he was faithful, but he could be a hothead. He could be somewhat erratic at times. You know, Peter was the type, what you say? Huh? Huh? Uh, There's a comedian that said, uh, I hope nobody's in my seat, and then I wish somebody would be in my seat. (laughs) Peter is, I wish somebody would be in my seat. Ready, always, right? That was Peter. So Peter, out of all the disciples, Jesus comes rolling up on them on the water. And Peter says, out of everybody else, Peter says, hey, if it's you, right? 
Verse 28 and 29 are Jesus and Peter having a violent match. Peter says, if it is you, then command me to come out on the water. Jesus replies with how many words do we see in the scripture? He says what? That's all he said. Peter's in the boat with 11 other disciples. He asks Jesus, if it's you, command me to come out in the water. Jesus gives him what he asked for. Come on. He identifies himself, said, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter, being Peter, cavalier, jump off God, ready to do anything for the Lord, somewhat erratic, but also in some ways the most faithful. Sometimes we could be so safe, so, so safe. My nine-month-old daughter, I, I, she would get close to the edge of the bed, and me being daddy, I would always, wait, 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 my wife, she not crazy. And in my head, she don't know no better. Until I tried it for myself. We were at home alone one day. She got close to the edge of the bed, and I had a loose grip of her foot. And I said, God, I ain't trying to break her leg, but I sure wanted to know that that edge is real. She just got to the edge of that thing and she looked back. <laughs> what would happen if I jumped down from this step here? You think I'd break an ankle? If you said yes, I know I'm big. I'm just saying, but would I break an ankle? <laughs> Typically. I look healthy. I'm not saying I am. <laughs> but some of us want instructions even on how to step down off of this step. Peter says, if it's you, command me to come out into the water. Jesus says, come. Peter being Peter steps out of the boat onto the sea and begins to walk on the water. Just a verse previous, Jesus had just made himself, had just identified himself. Take heart, it is I. How many times, however, do we ask the question twice? Did he say that was him? I, I had to misunderstand because this, 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 this step that he's telling me to make, this, this, this don't. I'm just going to keep praying. It's kind of like the story of the man who was abandoned at sea. He was in the middle of the sea, the Atlantic Ocean. And he kept praying, God, please save me. God, please save me. A little tugboat came by. Now I'm waiting on the Lord. Yeah. Another little raggedy, bigger tugboat came by. Hey, we're here. Rescue. No, man, I'm waiting on the Lord. I appreciate it, though. Two or three more opportunities came by, and he passed him by. said he was waiting on the Lord. He drowned. story is told is he drowned because he was waiting on the Lord, but the Lord sent him five opportunities to be saved. Yeah, right, right, right. But he was looking for what looked familiar, what, 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 what and how he thought the Lord would appear. Like the God told him, hey, I'm going to show up on the carnival magic, and I'm going to throw a life raft out with your name on it, and it's going to be specifically for you. When I was waiting on the Lord, and I felt a strong calling in my life. I'm like, Lord, you're you going to have to show me something. Because if, if I'm going to walk away from this, you're going to have to lay this thing out. In that season in my life, if I can tell you, it was the most ambiguous, misunderstood, I don't, I don't get it, signs that didn't make any sense. I literally, for almost 11 months, had my resignation letter sitting on my desktop at work. And I remember a pastor at the church at that point in time, I wasn't on staff, wasn't thinking about being on staff, no, nothing like that. He said, man, the Lord is not going to release you until you show an act of faith. An act of faith? Shoot, I didn't, act of faith? I done wrote the letter? <laughs> you know, they can look at my computer, you know, today they can see my desk, they can see it's there. I had no idea if they could or not. I just in my head, right? That's, that's my faith wall. 
God put me in a position where I had to quit. And being the OCD must have things lined up person that I thought I was, I didn't know where my next dollar was coming from. Matter of fact, he took me down to the last $50 in my account before I would get a job offer. And guess what that job offer was? I spoke with the senior pastor of Concord Church, never having worked in a church in my life. Don't come from a pedigree where somebody would know me walking in off the street. And I'm Peter, and everybody knows I'm Peter. Rough around the edges. Don't have degrees and stuff on the wall of, 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 on the backside of my name. Hired at Concord Church. My words were, if you have a position sweeping the floors, you let me know because I feel like God has something in store for me. The other end of that conversation, I feel like he does too, but I have no idea what it'll look like in what time frame. Let's pray. Huh? Hey, man, give me a job sweeping the floors, Pastor. Three and a half months, I couldn't get a job sweeping the floors at Concord Church. And the reason I keep saying Concord Church like I'm saying it is because this is what I'm saying. I don't know what your Concord is. I don't know what your get out of the boat come is. Have no idea. But what I do know what I do know, it's going to take an act of faith. I interviewed for over 15 positions, the main of which being a police officer. Okay, um, I'm this type. If I was a police officer, you wouldn't want to be pulled over by me. Because if you make the slightest move gesture like you're going to get me, I'm first. That's me. And it is probably a few that have been hired that way too. But... I remember getting to, in Richardson, to, it was, let's say it's 10 steps. I got to step eight. It was a lie detector test. First question, do you plan to tell the truth about all this? Yes. In the middle of the questions, hey, have you told the truth about the questions you've answered thus far? Yes. Last question on the test, have you told the truth about everything in here? Yes. It's over. He comes in. We see some deception, Mr. Williams. You see what? Man, I done told you things that don't nobody know. Because I, I, at that point, I wanted and I felt like I needed that job. God, if you don't do it today, this is, I'm at the end of the, I, I, don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. We sense deception. And he said, but if I'm being honest with you, the, the weirdest point of it all is that you answered all the key questions correctly. That being the first question. Do you plan to tell the truth? Yes. Middle question, have you told the truth? Yes. End question, have you told the truth about the entirety? Yes. All of those are right? Yes, sir, but there's deception in the middle. I remember walking out of that office and like, God, this ain't, this ain't it. This ain't what you told me to do. You told me to get out. I got out. I done interviewed at a thousand different places and you still won't give me a job? I can't even sweep the floors at the church, much less be a cop. I mean, I'm in the car crying, snot, bubbles. Every, my windows was tinted very, very dark, so nobody could see all this going on. But I'm snot. I'm, oh, man, God, yo, why you? Very clearly, you know what he said? Jeremy, all I told you to do is quit. All I told you, all I needed you to do is quit. God, I, but I did that. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. You know, like on the shows when you get to the best part of it, it's at a climax and it said, to be continued. Yeah. Yeah. And so, no, 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 I want to know what's going on. So for another month and a half, I just traveled like Jesus. I stopped interviewing. I stopped looking at places. And for a while, I'm, am, am I depressed? What's, what's going on? I was being obedient. Jeremy, I just told you, I didn't tell you to go apply for nothing else. I told you to sit still, something that is completely against who I am. That's me. What about you? 
tell you a quick story. I try not to tell embarrassing stories about my children, but every once in a while, um, I get an opportunity simply because I have a microphone. One day when they have one, maybe they'll do the same. Son, don't worry about it. I'm not going to get you today. This is your sister. So my daughter, when she was little, she was going to a gymnastics class. Going to gymnastics class, a gymnastics class, I'll never forget it, it was $58.73 per month, okay? My daughter is one of such, you got to kind of prod her along. You, you got to make sure she stays in there. And so this particular day, they were going to test her skills. So she's going throughout, there's probably about five different activities that she had to go through. She goes through one with the breeze, she gets through it. About the third thing, right in the middle there, she gets to some bars and they're uneven. It was only four, three or four. She gets to these bars, she looks back at me, and they allow me to kind of walk alongside her, and I'm walking alongside of her, and I'm afraid of heights. I'm looking at her, she's looking at the bar, and I said, Lord Jesus, I thank God and gave her my fear of heights, but here it is. She's afraid, she's looking at these bars, and she says, Daddy, I don't think I can do it. I said, baby, in my head, being daddy, it's $58.73 that says you can. <laughs> Looks back at me, I don't think I can. I picked her up, I put her on the bars, I said, you're going to do it, though. And I'm standing under the bars, and all she had to do was walk across it. I'm standing under the bars, and I feel something wet fall on my head. She's crying. <laughs> Mixed with snot and a whole bunch of other nasty stuff. I'm standing under, she goes through the bars. She gets to the end, she jumps down and she says, Daddy, I did it. I thought to myself, you did it, huh? Daddy wasn't nowhere around. You were just crying probably about 15 seconds ago, but now you did it, right? Sometimes we do the exact same thing. When we get into the place that God wants for us, we can get to what we consider to be the end, that place where we've arrived and we said, ah, I did it. We failed to realize, like my daughter failed to realize, she didn't have a bank account, debit card, check, no nothing to write the gymnastics place for $58.73 every month. But she jumped down and she said, I did it. Jesus paid a far more critical price than $58.73 for us to jump down in parts and places in our life and say, hey, I did it. The other thing I want you to recognize here in the text, it says, Peter came walking out on the water. On one word, Jesus told him to come. He walks out on the water. He's on the water. It's just him and the Lord. He's not worried about his homeboys back in the boat. Just him and the Lord out on the water, right? He asked him to identify himself. Jesus identified himself. It's me. Come out on the water. He gets out on the water. We get to the last point here. It says every disciple needs a prescription for fear. He's out on the water. Verse 30 reads, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Peter, who after walking on the water, has done something terribly wrong that goes wrong with his eyesight. He defies gravity. He defies buoyancy. He is now the only man besides the Lord to walk on water. Maybe this is normal for some, but I need you to lean in quickly. It, 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 it says Peter saw the wind. It says, Peter saw the wind. When's the last time you saw wind? If the wind was blowing outside, the only way that I would know of, which I'm looking outside right now, some trees are swaying. Third watch of the night. It's dark. Winds, waves, everything's swirling. But I submit to you today, Peter couldn't see the wind. But the text says he saw the wind. We got a problem, right? 
Fear allowed Peter to see what wasn't real. Because of Peter's fear, he saw something he couldn't naturally see. Fear is an acronym that says false expectations appearing real. Sometimes as Christians, we can, we can have some, some spiritual hallucinations. P- Peter, Peter got out of the boat, is walking on water, and all of a sudden he sees the wind. God, Jesus told him to get in the boat, go to the other side. They got in the boat. Go to the other side, third watch of the night, comes rolling up on them. They say, oh, no, they're scared. It's a ghost. No, it's me. Take heart. Peter says, if it's you, command me to come out in the water. Jesus says, come. Peter gets out of the boat and goes out on the water. Here, 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 here's what I don't want you to miss. I know you guys are in a series of risk and reward. What risk was Peter taking? by getting out of the boat. Pretty big risk, right? He could drown, right? Very easily. God, I don't know if this is you. I don't don't know what it is. I'm I'm, going to get out of here. Peter did get, you know, and I heard preachers, I mean, really, I mean, nailed Peter to the cross about getting out of the boat, getting scared. Yeah, I mean, and it does say, oh, you of little faith. Here's what we can't miss. He had enough faith to get out of the boat. That's Peter's situation. What about about us? In what situation is God telling you, get out of the boat? You asked me for it. I gave it to you. Not in what it seems familiar or comfortable to you, but all I told you to do is get out of the boat. You ask me, hey, hey, if it's you, command me. I commanded you. You did what I told you to do. But now I'm in the middle of this thing, and it's not looking good. I'm starting to see the wind, y'all. It's the AC is blowing in here. I know it is. Can you see it? Can you feel it? the point I'm trying to make is that comfort is in the boat. Complacency is in the boat. Familiarity is in the boat. What mama did is in the boat. What daddy did is in the boat. What I don't have a certification for is in the boat. What I don't quite understand is in the boat. Faith is on the water. The risk is he could have drowned. The reward is Peter's name is in the Bible for walking on the water. What will you be remembered for? One of the other 11 disciples that stayed in the boat while it was one that was courageous enough to get out? You know, that's what my family's always done. You know, they done, they done always stayed on the south side. They done always stayed on the north side. I, you know, that just, that's, you know, that's what I'm going to do. It's wrong with a family legacy. It's nothing wrong with doing what comes in when you won't get out of the boat. Peter's faith, yes, became faulty when he began to see the wind. How would it have read differently if he would have remained faithful? Sometimes in life, God isn't asking for you to do what you feel like is extraordinary. (laughs) Sometimes we on all these airs so people, you know, I did this and I did that. You ain't done one thing God didn't ask you to do. You've done a bunch of stuff that looks good on paper. 
you resume ready. But you don't fail faith. If I had never, if I had never turned in a resignation at a company that I knew God had given me an expiration date on, if I waited to get another job before I submitted, hey, I'm done, I, I, I'm afraid of where I'd be. Heard it said before, a lot of times people, preachers, pastors think that we're the upper echelon and we're better than people and all this. Well, the fact of the matter is, it's just like Peter. God knows he better keep me close to him. You let me get too far out of bounds. It, oof. If I'm being honest. But the point is, what about you? God has a get out of the boat experience for all of us. With everything that's going on in the world today, some of us have secluded ourselves and just said, you know what? I'm going to stay in my house and wait for the Lord to come back. I'm going to go to work, buy my groceries, mind my business, drive the speed limit. Don't take no cops off on the north side. <laughs> Not taping this. No, anyways, um, just going to be safe. The reward is far greater than the risk. And if we think about it this way, is there really a such thing as taking a risk for the Lord? If I go into business with somebody, I'm taking a risk. If I invest in Pookie and them company and, you know, it go belly up, I just took a risk. If I pray to God, I need you to show up and show up in my life professionally, spiritually, personally. I like, I need you physically. I like, I need you. Am I taking a risk? God didn't even, Jesus, God didn't consider us a risk. When he sent his only son, Jesus, he didn't say, man, I sure hope this thing works out. But then we have the audacity to, to give back to him fear. We allow ourselves to be distracted by some of the most mundane, something as simple as a foolish text message comes across our phone and throw us off for the whole week. I can't believe I can't, that's just. Did you hear what? Did, did you see that? Reality, unreality TV. We, we, we sometimes allow that to drive our train of thought and our thinking. We begin to look at people through the lens of what we see on TV. Them people being paid to do that. Come on, come, come on now. It looks good. It's entertaining. What I submit to you today is in efforts to cut down on the distractions that cause us to be fearful. It's really, really simple, actually. When God tells us to do something, I'm sorry, it, it, it's not a mind-blowing thought. Just do it. But here's the most important part. How do I know when God is speaking to me? How do I know when he's telling me to do something? Here's something else that's really, really simple. My nine-month-old daughter knows my voice because she listens for it. And because we converse often. If she only saw or heard from me once a month, so in her nine months, if she only heard from me nine times, do you think she would respond to me? Or that I would be able to respond to her? I know her cry. <laughs> On cue. So again, very simple. Sometimes you don't know if it's the Lord talking because you don't know his voice. And of myself, in and of our circumstances, Lord, there's many distractions. 
There's many things that seek to derail us from what it is that you have for us individually and collectively. Lord, and I just come praying for this church. I just come praying for this body. I come praying for everyone under the sound of my voice. That you remind us, dear Lord, that you're God. And what we consider risk, you consider reward. You consider it faithfulness. And your repayment plan is incomprehensible. The song says, who the sun sets free is free indeed. So in that freedom, Lord, may we get busy being who it is you've so called us to be. Thank you for those whispers that you've uh, let us know to confirm what it is that we may be doing correctly. Those things that you've told us that we're not on the right track. Lord, so I just come praying now that we have the courage to get out of the boat. Get out of that place of comfort, dear Lord, and do something that only you have created us to do. There's a specific work. There's a specific placement that you have on each of our lives. And God, we need you to continue to reveal that to us. But even in the revealing, may we not sit still and get complacent upon what it is you called us to do. May we still work sometimes even in the dark spaces of our lives, knowing that you're ultimately at work and that you have a work and you have a position and a placement that you've called us to, that you can get us through. God, we love you. We thank you for who you are, even in spite of who we are. You love us. So today, may we submit our lives to you in full. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Bless you.